great pleasure to um, introduce and to welcome uh, a great friend and, and colleague, uh, Frank Reiswerman, who is the uh, CEO of the CGIR Consortium uh, in Montpellier, France. He's the CEO of the Consortium of the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, which brings together uh, 15 research centers involved in different aspects of agriculture around the world. The, uh, the wonderful thing is that Frank, um, in addition to heading this uh, global consortium, is a renowned water specialist, somebody who really is able to connect these issues of water and food from his expertise on global water issues. He's worked for over 30 years um, as a researcher, as a consultant in natural resources management, um, and in particular on these issues of water and food. Um, immediately before joining the, um, the CGIR consortium as CEO, he was right here in Seattle uh, with the Gates Foundation, working with Jeff Rakes um, as head of the, uh, the water sanitation and hygiene uh, program. Many of you might know Frank from the uh, Inventing a Better Toilet uh, campaign, um, which had a lot of uh, uh, interest and attention. Prior to that, he was at Google as the director of its philanthropic division and led the public health grant making. And before that, he was director general of the International Water Management Institute uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, we couldn't have uh, thought of a better person to come and and, uh, and chat with us about these issues of water and food and data. So I um, hope you'll join me in welcoming Frank Reiswerman uh, to the podium. Frank. Thank you, Roberto. I have a bit of a habit of following Roberto, who so far hasn't mentioned he was the Director General of IMI when it was still called the International Irrigation Management Institute before me. Uh, and indeed, I was listening with interest to Jeff's presentation. We didn't exactly coordinate, but I suspected he would start to talk about Nebraska and the Rakes family farm and argue up. And I'll come from the other end. They'll talk about global issues, and we do meet in a few places in the middle. There were one or two surprises in your slides, and I'll come back to that uh, in a bit. But first, I wanted to talk with you about something that has been part of uh, my career in water for more than 30 years. People have talked about the looming water crisis for pretty much my whole career. Uh, still have to figure out, yes, how to make this work. You've probably all gone to conferences where people talked about the world water crisis, the global water crisis, and so on. When I was a graduate student, not in Nebraska, but in, in Colorado, uh, my professor there, Neil Grieg, he talked about a water crisis, but he meant the lack of investment in the aging, crumbling infrastructure in water and sanitation here in this country. Uh, but internationally, people speak about the world water crisis they usually refer to lack of drinking water. I will, yes. Now, there's all kinds of images that go with that. Uh, but usually people think of not having enough water to drink. Surprisingly, because as people in this room know, uh, the amount of water we need to drink is only a very small percentage. But the imagery that goes with the world water crisis in most people's minds is not having enough water to drink. Sometimes it has to do with having quite polluted water, of course, which we have uh, as well, as you know. And occasionally somebody explains what we actually use the water for, which tends to be for agriculture, for growing food. And every once in a while, of course, somebody says, well, is this crisis for real? I frankly have been through this kind of conversation so many times that I was uh, very pleased that uh, some 15 years ago people said, okay, can we actually take this the other way around? Can we, rather than always talk about a world water crisis, uh, 
and a world water crisis that, in my view, and I think in the people in the room here, often has the wrong images associated with it because it really isn't a tiny bit of water that is left. Uh, in fact, if you get uh, to the more realistic images, if you start to look at how much water is left per person, then you'll see we're talking about hundreds. Yeah, you can see that. It's not the best picture, but you can see we're talking about thousands of cubic meters per person per year. If you start to think in your mind how much you need per day, even in California, three, 400 liters per day is still only a small fraction of this. So as we know, in this room, not having enough water, water scarcity, really means that in the countries where there is water scarcity, there is not enough water to grow food. In the more iconic images of the Aral Sea, where there is no more water left and the ships are falling on the floor, that wasn't to do with people drinking it all up. It was with, to do with irrigation. So yes, maps like these, even though they're often associated with images of people not having enough water in their well, have all to do with countries that don't have enough water to grow food. The blue countries where water is scarce, the red countries where there is water stress. It really isn't that there isn't a drop of water left to drink. Now, can we come up with a vision of how to do things differently? Can we envision a world without a crisis? Can we take this positively? And indeed, it was the World Water Council uh, as part of the preparation for its second World Water Forum that says, can we bring people together to figure out what it would take to have a world without a crisis? And indeed, we developed scenarios as part of that, and we did modeling. Uh, I would have to say that the modeling at that time, uh, this was more than 15 years ago, we didn't exactly have a big data revolution, so it often felt more like crystal ball gazing than modeling and harnessing massive amounts of data. We had we had panels, I can tell you, of experts who would come together and would usually tell us that, you know, predicting the future is pretty difficult. There was one panel only of people from the oil industry, particularly from Shell, where they have a, a long history of scenarios, and they said, okay, there isn't very much that we can tell you. We're, we're in agreement about one fact, though. We're pretty sure that oil prices will stay at about $10 a barrel. <laughs> and indeed, they were up to about 100 shortly after. Just to show you that it's kind of difficult to come up with all these things. Uh, but yes, we had a major exercise that involved some 15,000 people in a participatory process. And probably the value of this large exercise where we were sitting, Bill Cosgrove and I, in the little office in UNESCO, was that we sort of had a model that we dropped a stone in the pond. And there were ripples out there. And years later, I would meet people that said, did you know that we did a national water vision as part of that overall process? And we sort of started to think about our future and how we could bring these things together. Uh, that probably had some value. And we had uh, a fairly big party uh, in The Hague. That was the second World Water Forum. The first Water Forum was a small group of people, kind of like this, you know, four or 500 people in Marrakesh. And then in The Hague, we thought this should be a bit bigger, and it became I think it was eight or 9,000 people and a lot of enthusiasm, including, I don't know how many of you, anybody here in the room that was in The Hague in the World Second World War Forum? Yes, a number of you. So you may actually remember the nude protesters that showed up sort of like right here in front of Minister of Water of Egypt, Abu Zaid, and who were protesting the dam building. So yes, we have to realize these discussions we're having here, they're not just about data, they're not just about modeling, they grab people, they stir emotions, and they are, indeed, right at the heart of social debate. They did also lead to quite a bit of uh, action, I would say. I mean, after that conference, the Millennium Development Goal on water and the investments government made, particularly in clean water for drinking, have made a big difference. The Millennium Development Goal for drinking water was achieved as one of the goals well ahead of schedule, although sadly, embarrassingly, the goal on sanitation was probably least achieved, which was one of the reasons, by the way, where most people have a program on water and sanitation, but the facto they spend 90% of their energy on water and a little bit on sanitation. 
I was quite proud that the Gates Foundation decided to put 90% of its energy in sanitation. Indeed, our team called ourselves uh, the toilet team, uh, proudly so. Uh, I'll meet with them again tomorrow, which is a great opportunity for being here in Seattle. So water for food. Water for food wasn't such a big deal, maybe, as was drinking water and sanitation and world water vision. But I would say we concluded we should talk more about water for food and environment. Because uh, when I joined IMI in the year 2000 and I asked people about environment, they said, oh, yeah, we do a lot of things about the environment. Water logging, salinity, water logging and salinity. But there was not a lot of talk about biodiversity or landscapes or ecosystem services or wetlands. In fact, I would say that both water for food and water for nature were very strong pillars of the World Water Vision, but they were silos. They were talking uh, past each other, by and large. Uh, that has changed a bit, I would say, in the world. Uh, but certainly a lot more is to be done. Uh, at that time, this is about 15 years ago, we started a dialogue on water for food and environment to bring you know, UNEP and WHO and FAO together to bring ICID and IUCN, to bring all those organizations that usually speak to each other in groups like this to each other, but not to the other group together and have a dialogue for food and environment. We also started a fairly major uh, exercise at IMI that again, many hundreds of scientists were involved in it was called the Comprehensive Assessment of Water Management and Agriculture, which was meant to be an effort to build and share the knowledge base on water for food and environment. So yes, there were reports coming out of this, but the idea was that we were building the knowledge base that we were bringing together the data, if you like, based on which there could be an action program. We called it a challenge program on water and food in bases where we could actually work on increasing water productivity using the data and information for action. Now, I won't speak to you about the challenge program on water and food. Jeremy Bird is in the room and other colleagues from IMI. The, the challenge program ended in, well, just earlier this year. So I think that will be a big part of their presentations. But let me say that in 2006, seven, the comprehensive assessment came out with it reports uh, and quite a few books uh, and indeed People like Jeff actually read those. When I joined the Gates Foundation, he said, oh, I have this nice book here. And so, you know, there is some, some impact that you can have with those exercises. I think we did manage to build a bit of a, a database. Now, what was the, the key conclusion that I at least drew for myself out of that whole exercise, the comprehensive assessment? One was that we tend to think, certainly I was raised as an engineer, to think about the blue water, what Malin Falkenmark and Johan Rockström called the blue water that portion of, of rainfall that runs off, that becomes the water in our rivers. We tend not to count the other part, the green water. We tend to focus on only the water resources indeed that we can measure, that we can capture, that we can reroute. But of course our crops are directly dependent and certainly nature is directly dependent on the green water. And thinking more about green and blue water as one system and thinking about how we can work with those together, if you like, uh, the thinking that Malin Falcon, Mark, and Johan Rockstrom promoted quite a bit. Uh, I think that leads us to see the greatest opportunities. And surprisingly, out of the comprehensive assessment, the conclusion was that we globally probably had the largest opportunity for increased water productivity in the African savannas. The African savannas, my people might say, grow a lot more food there. Well, yes, when you realize that the agroecosystems there are very similar to the Brazilian Cerrados, probably the last major global food basket that the world has unlocked by indeed managing agronomy and soils and water and uh, inter interestingly introducing some pretty effective African forage grasses, then you realize that maybe it would be time to, to think quite differently about sub-Saharan Africa and that we might have our last, our next major revolution in particularly water for food right there in, in Africa. So yes, thinking about green and blue water and thinking about how countries are in very different positions in how they use green water, the, if you like, the, the water vapor, the, the, the soil moisture, and how they use the, the blue water, with India being one of the countries, one of the only countries where, in fact, uh, the dependence on blue water 
is larger than the dependence on green water. India is probably the country where we have had the biggest investment uh, in irrigation because their monsoon means that water otherwise runs off uh, very quickly. Uh, but yes, thinking differently about water for me certainly was one of the key things uh, that I learned from the comprehensive assessment. Of course, our good friend Johan Rockström has upped the ante. He came out in, this, in 2009 with this paper that I think most of you will probably have heard about or have read. And if you haven't, I think it's a, a very good read. This is about planetary boundaries. So this now takes, I think, the scales as far away from the Rakes family farm as you can get. This is saying, okay, sure, how can we connect precision agriculture to know within the field of the Rakes family farm what to do and how to apply fertilizer precisely. But how, on the other hand, do we also realize that all these fields together have managed to start to influence the planet, the planet we live on, and that we might be pretty close to some planetary boundaries if we don't manage to act collectively in addition to individually. So what do we miss? in that whole process, the World Water Vision, all these other exercises that I can tell you about. Well, I have to admit that during my career, quite early on, in the early 80s, I met people in Boulder at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Mickey Glantz and John Feirer, and they were always talking about climate change. At the time, I would say, people thought about this as a, a very worthy subject, I did too, but something that would be relevant for my, my kids, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, we always talked about what it would do in 100 years. I don't think that we ha actually had the perspective, as we gradually have, I think, come to realize over the last couple decades, that climate change is really here with us now, that it's something that farmers face today, that it's something that we will have to do, not for our grandchildren, but much sooner. So yes, climate change has certainly arisen on the agenda uh, with a very big fat star. I was uh, very pleased, therefore, uh, I was in New York a few weeks ago uh, at the climate summit to hear the US president speak, and I'm not saying Barack Obama, the US president, we wouldn't have thought that we would have a US president speaking out in the UN climate summit and committing to in introduce resilience to climate change in all USAID projects. Also, climate change for a long time, I think, has focused primarily on energy, on transportation. But as of the last IPCC assessment, and the whole conversation is changing to realize much more how central agriculture is to this whole climate change debate in two ways. Of course, agriculture is going to be impacted uh, a lot through climate change, particularly through water, but also about 30% or so of all emissions come from agriculture, from land use change generally, deforestation, or from what we do to the management of our, our ecosystems. And because the curves, the forecasted emissions from energy and transport are actually curving downwards, because for a few decades there has been a lot of action there, and frankly we haven't done very much in agriculture yet, there are predictions that the share of agriculture of the total emissions can go up over the next few decades to as much as 70%. I bet you that by that time everybody will be focusing on agriculture when they talk about climate change. But I was very pleased to already see that in just a year, when you go to Africa, you talk to African governments, the African Union, but a year ago people say, no, climate change, you know, we have more urgent problems. They've started to realize that both it is urgent and it's an opportunity. So now African governments are well ahead of many others to say, okay, we have formed an African Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance, and we think that by 2020 we can affect millions of smallholder farmers through smarter agriculture, increased resilience. We're pleased, though, that there was also a global alliance formed uh, in New York uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the CGIR was a proud co-host with FAO of that meeting, and country after country uh, would stand up and say, yes, we will work on agriculture and climate change. We are joining this global alliance. And indeed, uh, we had a reception in the evening uh, where the Dutch Minister for Agriculture, Sharon Dijksma, was the guest of John Kerry to talk about agriculture and climate change 
as a key foreign policy interest of the United States. Now, I don't know whether you think that's momentous, but I think that's a pretty big change in how we perceive agriculture as part of climate change, how we perceive the urgency about climate change. And I think it has a lot to do with what we'll all be working on in years to come. So I'm very interested to see how can we indeed harness big data and little data to address those issues. Now in the CGIR, we had a question a bit earlier whether we have focused a bit too much on maize, on rice, on wheat, on the key cereals. There are indeed such discussions. Is the world overinvested in cereals? And should we invest more in other crops or in more nutritious or more healthy food? And certainly, we're in the middle of a new strategy, strategy and results framework. So I'm speaking a little bit ahead of the consensus that we're trying to build. But the three key challenges that the CGIR is likely to pick up as the drivers of our programs over the next uh, five, 10, possibly longer, period of, of time, five, 10 years, are those three. So definitely, there's still intensification, but now we're all talking about sustainable intensification. I think recognizing much more than before that we have to have increased productivity, increased efficiency, but not just in the field, not just thinking from an input perspective, but much more thinking from the agri-food system perspective, thinking about value chains, thinking about landscapes, thinking about healthy landscapes. Those are pretty tricky, pretty complex problems. I think we will need a lot of data, a lot of big data and little data to make progress on such complex interlinked problems. It is also true that health and nutrition are getting higher up on the agenda, I think, very quickly. While I was at the Gates Foundation, we were working on sanitation. Uh, and at the same time, we could see that health and agriculture were starting to talk about to each other about nutrition. And indeed, we were then the third group in the room from water saying, and yes, and sanitation as well. Because when you are trying to end polio and you vaccinate kids, you know, you have a mother holding that kid in her arms, you give them three drops, and then you hope that a baby will become resistant to polio. And it takes seven, eight, nine times before that baby converts. It is because when your child is underfed or when your child has chronic diarrhea, they're not likely to indeed react to the vaccine the same way a healthy child would. So those three things are very much linked. And that, I think, is what the Gates Foundation realizes. That's what many others realize. So yes, we have to look more at health and nutrition sensitive agriculture. That means not just how many calories we get, but do people also have the micronutrients, the iron, the zinc, the vitamins? Can we do that? not just through food supplements, which is not a sustainable solution, but can we build that right into the plants? Can we biofortify the plants to have golden rice, as you know, which is a GMO, but also yellow flesh sweet potato or orange versions of maize, for that matter, that have higher levels of the micronutrients that people need to have healthy lives. Also, I think food safety is going up as a priority quite a bit. Once you start looking at value change, you realize you know, you're not done as a farmer when it leaves the farm gate. You're really only done when it arrives at the consumer. And if there's aflatoxins in the value chain, that can create quite a bit of market disruption. If you're a farmer and suddenly European markets close and you can't you know, export your peanuts anymore, or when there are diseases and markets close because people don't want to buy the meat anymore. So food safety that, I think, will have a lot to do with affordable sanitation and safe, safe reuse, and therefore a lot to do with how we use water in agriculture uh, is high on the agenda as well. Climate smart agriculture, already mentioned that, resilient land, soil, forest, and water ecosystems in the presence of, of climate change. And of course, some cross-cutting issues, uh, gender, absolutely top priority. It's going to be right across uh, all these other priorities, as well as having better partnerships and, and focusing probably in an increased way in how we not just do great research, but when you think about how that gets delivered to the farmer, how you have key partnerships of, of partners that are capable to do that. So we need to develop capacity with those partners as well. All right, if that is, if you like, uh, what we are up against. So what can the data revolution do for us? And partly I wanted to bring up some of our data challenges in the past as the kind of things that maybe we could overcome. 
And I will tell you that, you know, Pascal Estaduto stood up just now, he's from FAO, they are, you know, the, the keeper of a lot of key statistics, and that's how the world has mostly gathered all this data. Not just uh, in Nebraska where farmers collected their data, but then not all got aggregated up, and in the end it ended up with FAO, and that was what we based our global map of irrigated areas on. But knowing that once a government invested somewhere to have, I don't know, 50,000 hectares equipped for irrigation, didn't mean there actually was irrigation on 50,000 hectares. You could come back there 10 years later and find only half of the nominal area under irrigation was actually growing plants with water that were, you know, with irrigated, uh, irrigated fields. Or in other areas where it was actually the farmers that had put in some tube wells, you know, and some tube wells can be tens of millions of tube wells in India, weren't showing up in the, in the statistics. So when I arrived at IMI, there was a, a Dutchman, Wim Bastiansen, uh, and actually a family member of his sits at the table right there, and he wants to talk to me about right this subject in the coffee break. And Wim, he's, he's a bit similar to, to Wim, I think. Wim, when I got to, to IMI, said, I have a deal for you. If you give me a million dollars in three years, I'll produce a map of irrigated areas of the world based on real data, on remote sensing data. So we fell for that. I warn you for the coffee break. We fell for that when we got wise. <laughs> it took six years and quite a bit more money, I can tell you as well. Uh, and in the end, we had what was called by, no, not by IMI, but by others, a very coarse product in a positive way. There was actually a product based on a 10 kilometer grid. Uh, Prasad Tenkabail, I don't know if he's here now. He worked on that heroically with, with a group of colleagues. He's in Arizona now with the USGS and he still keeps working on those products. But in about six years, we produced this one pretty rough map uh, based on real data. Now, we will see other challenges like that, I think. It's not always as fast and as easy as we might suggest. There are going to be pretty big hurdles before we can actually uh, make these things practical. But then I was going to tell, and they didn't put this in because, you know, Ad Bastiansen is now in the room, who, who actually is uh, with eLeaf here. I was quite impressed that Wim Bastiansen managed to not just be an academic and make maps. He also thought about how can we take this to the farmer? How can we offer a commercial service you know, where I can get potato farmers to give me some money and then every two weeks I will tell them what the evapotranspiration in their field is and they can use that to irrigate their crops. And in, indeed, the company eLeaf now provides that kind of service. And there are quite a few other companies that do that as well. I was very pleased to see as part of the program here that we now have you know, eddy covariance towers where we can do direct measurements of ev evapotranspiration in the field. Great stuff. It's moving very fast and it will probably be pretty tough work to get there. Because yes, we have these poor soil maps. Jeff already mentioned it. We all use the FAO 1974 soil maps which have big blobs of the same color over sometimes whole countries where we know that you know, there is the intra-field differences that are really important. And then there is an effort to make a digital soil map of the world or indeed this African soil information service, which I think shows much more that it's not going to be a picture this time. It's an information service that's going to be continuously built up with databases and people polling whatever the latest status of that information is. We also have horrible weather records in Africa. And when you start to do things like let's have uh, drought insurance, for instance. People who tried that, as AXA, a French insurance company, together with the World Food Program did, they found they didn't have enough data to actually assess the risk at a fine enough scale to be able to sell a product. So yes, there were pretty serious limitations in the data that we had. And we also saw that there was reduced willingness to keep measuring. I mean, sometimes the hydrological networks that were set up by the British during colonial times have been gradually disappearing. And some people have been ringing the alarm bell of widespread decline in hydrological monitoring that threatened actually progress in, in areas of water. And I just wanted to bring that up because we have here this very enthusiastic and very positive feel about massive amounts of data coming down the pipe. And it's true, but in other areas, uh, we've seen reduced willingness to just keep doing the hard work of measuring the data that we all need. And of course, a pet peeve of mine as a director of a research institute was that we endlessly made plans to share the data after we collected them, 
But you know, an individual researcher does their research, has their data on their hard drive, they'll look after them very carefully for as long as they need them to publish. And after that, the incentive to look after the data tends to drop massively and it falls in the big black hole. So yes, there are some lessons, I think, uh, related to our data problems that aren't going to go away just automatically. So harnessing the data revolution. I'll give you some examples. Uh, and the surprise I had was that I thought, you know, I hadn't talked to Jeff, but I thought he would probably talk about Microsoft and I would talk about Google. So when you put the slide about Google up, Jeff, which was actually a product that my team developed when I was there, you surprised me a bit. But I would, wanted to give you one example. When I went to Google, the point I'm trying to make here is that there is this huge gap between what is a big data problem in the private sector, where they are miles ahead, and what we consider the big data problem at EMI. In the beginning, you know, Google.org was set up to say, can we use the power of the company, of the engineers they have there, to deal with the problems that we have out there in the area where I used to work? And I would go to these engineers and I would explain to them what the problem was. And they would say, that's not a big data problem. And I was like, sounds like a pretty big data problem to me. And they were like, nah, that's not a big data problem. It was too small for them. The gap was huge. We finally convinced them that actually bringing together all the world's remote sensing data uh, in one place, not just as you know, flat pictures as you have in Google Earth, but in Google Earth Engine where you actually have the actual data, where as a remote sensing scientist you could build your model and access all Landsat scenes that were made free by the US Geological Survey, but in one database, like boom, and then use Google supercomputers to do the, the modeling. That was what they considered to be a decent challenge as a big data problem. And indeed, I was pleased to read I was gone already, so I won't take any credit, but my colleagues there continued that hard work, and they produced with Matt Hansen of the University of Maryland maps of deforestation, 30 meters, so not very fine grain, 30 meters uh, over a period of 2000 to 2012 that used 650,000 650, Landsat images and a hundred and a million, <laughs> the numbers, it's not even tet you know, it's not exabytes or petabytes, but we get lost already. They're already impressive, uh, Jeff. A million CPU hours in a few days using Google's distributed computer power. So those are the kind of things that are possible. And indeed, when I was still working there, I was arguing with them that we should use a similar infrastructure for evapotranspiration as well. And just because it's Ebola time, I thought I'd tell you my, my, my main job at Google was actually to work on a program that was called predict and prevent emerging infectious diseases. Yes, just like Ebola, if you like. Because the problem there is very often a data problem. It is finding out what those new viruses are, it is getting them reported fast enough, and then organizing the response. Genetic detection, we call that, digital detection, and then surveillance, particularly if you don't have a vaccine. Now, the example I gave, and these are slides I just took from a, a speech I held in a global health conference in 2009, and I looked at it when I was looking at slides for this conference, and I, you know, it is so similar to the Ebola case, where we're finding, you know, in this case, the index case is called Mr. Duncan, and then uh, some health workers get infected, and then we have a fairly massive issue. So these are actually pretty shall I say, typical issues, and they're much closer to home than you might think. Many of those diseases are zoonoses. They often go through livestock. They can be transmitted through water. So here was another example of Rift Valley fever, for instance. We won't spend much time, but I would just like you to think that actually this is not a far from your bed issue for public health. This is pretty close to, to agriculture. And the issues to do with big data are quite similar. So yes, there we were talking about can we come up with diagnostics that assess the quality, not you know, the intra-field, but the intra-village you know, numbers about health somewhere in the jungle in Laos. And can we get that information out quick enough through sequencing and then uploading it through the cloud to some big database? And the conclusion there was, and I deliberately used the slide I used there because I think it's almost the same conclusion we'll be discussing here, is that yes, the amount of data have become you know, almost a commodity. For years and years in agriculture, people all try to get increased capacity to do the sequencing in their institute. And now, basically, the idea is we might as well put the sample in an envelope and send it to China because they can do this more quickly. 
that in a way has become the commodity. The challenge then is, what do we do with all that data? Can we analyze it? Can we turn it from data into information? It's complex, uh, it's time intensive and sensitive, and it's computationally heavy. So it's almost become a search problem. That's why we looked at it there. We could have people discover all these viruses, but then they needed to find in that big haystack where the needle was. I'm showing you this just a little bit for fun to say that how that changed. Now, this was for a health customer. I don't know whether farmers are going to be just like that, whether they can figure this out for themselves and then just come back to University of Nebraska and say, I just want your second opinion to make sure that I got this right. But it changes the nature of the farmer, the consumer, into becoming much more in charge of that information. And of course, the fact that these consumers all look online was indeed exactly the basis for that tool that uh, Jeff mentioned, Google Flu Trends, where you can, if you have big enough computers and a big enough search algorithm, analyze the behavior of people online to find out where the flu outbreak is. I won't say more about this now, but you know, things like that, or things where you can have people chat with each other, uh, geolocated. Uh, here, we use it for mapping, but other people use this to organize demonstrations to throw over governments. And then when the government turns, on the, turns off the internet, just reading, flying over here yesterday in uh, Times, in Hong Kong, the demonstrations that we have now, where the government said, okay, no more of that, no more tweeting, no more stuff, we'll turn it off. The latest app, also coming out of San Francisco, is called Fire Chat. And if we all have our Apple phones on and we all have our local networks on them, then we can actually chat with each other and create our own network and we can organize a demonstration, or let's say here, when we want to go for lunch, without being dependent on the internet. I thought that was pretty amazing. And it shows you how power indeed goes to consumers. One more example of that, uh, in part because it was a nice link between Washington. There was a professor from the University of Washington here, Gaetano Borriello, who came on sabbatical uh, because there were these new phones. I'm sorry, they were Android phones, but it means open phones that actually have a little computer in your pocket. And rather than filling out the forms on paper, you can do it over the phone. It can upload to a database. If the person has been interviewed before, you can pull that information down. It puts the information right in your pocket, right in the field. And then if you make this into a different context, right into the pocket of the farmer as well. I've seen so many places where you go to the back of beyond, you know, with a, a field trip and you know, you're, you're going with the government and they have a translator and then you go to a little village and you see the lady who shows you around and, you know, it has to be translated from the local language into French and then into English and you feel very far off the grid. Then everybody is done. You walk back to the cars and the lady pulls her phone out and, and sort of calls up her daughter and said, I'll be home for lunch a little bit later. <laughs> In whatever language I couldn't understand. The phones in farmers' pockets, I think, change the way we do business just as much as the big data does. If you want to know more about Open Data Kit, it's alive and well. It's an open source uh, organization now. You can check out there. One more thing before we'll start to wrap up. Crowdsourcing. I'm sure you're all uh, very familiar with crowdsourcing. But the point I was going to make is the speed with which these things happen. And this was Haiti when there was an earthquake. The earthquake happened on January 12. On January 13, Haiti was almost a white spot on the map. In Google Maps or in others, there was very little information available. And then in just a few days, people self-organized in organizations like OpenStreetMap, Ushahidi, Crisis Mapper, a number of them. Nobody was the boss. Nobody organized this. As a World Bank or a USAID project, it would have taken a couple of years to prepare uh, and cost millions of dollars. It just happened. A couple of weeks later, the map of Port-au-Prince looked like that. Now, that changes the way you think about doing business. And I would say that uh, people in the room here probably aren't used to doing business as rapidly, or with the young people that have this at their fingertips. I'd have to say, when I moved in the CGIR, when I started there, I was one of the youngest DGs in my 40s, and when I came to Google, uh, you know, as a young person in the CGIR, I was considered, you know, several generations out of it. All the rest of the people on my team were like 27. And, you know, engineers were the big deal in Google, so I sometimes said, I'm an engineer too. 
and said, oh, computer science? I said, well, no. Oh, okay, not interesting. Or I said, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I started my own company. We did software. Oh, and they said, you know, in the cloud, you know? And I said, no, this is 19, you know, 1989. Said, oh, forget that. Irrelevant is the experience of the large majority of the people sitting in the room here, I say, irreverently. You know, when are we willing to give a team of 25 to 29-year-olds sort of control over developing the next products? That's pretty difficult to imagine in the kind of organizations I work in, but it's pretty much day-to-day -day in many of those companies that's come up with all the stuff that you see here. So it's not just the data revolution, it's also how we work and who we work with. And I happen to have a little follow-up slide to the one that Jeff had on AFSIS. So what they are currently doing is uh, a big data analysis, a competition where they're asking teams to come up with their best solution, students wherever around the world, and they have 1,100 teams competing. So yes, we are doing some things like that, uh, but not routinely. So my positive about the potential that big and little data, little data as in the stuff that you know, gets from people's phones, from users, can make, I would say absolutely. And are there challenges? Of course there are, absolutely there are. What are future concerns? I think we have to talk a lot more about privacy. I mean, that's privacy in the sense of, uh, are we getting data that people don't want us to have? Or uh, as I, you know, even over breakfast this morning said, you know. Are farmers in the U.S. going to accept open data if they think the IRS might come back to them? Uh, privacy is a big deal. Fraud, hacking, manipulation. I mean, when do scientists like we have in the room here think that people might hack and have an interest in their data? But if we have these big databases uh, in one of our centers, hacking, people trying to get into the databases of the research institute, has become pretty normal. That's different. I'm also a bit concerned that there is this massive gap between public research and industry. I think it was mentioned here already where Monsanto is or where the banks are or where industry is in their ability to manage large amounts of data. We've all become used to, you know, wherever in the world, putting a little piece of plastic in the wall and then getting money out. If it takes 20 seconds, you're kind of like, hello, you know, why does this take so long? But in the meantime, they go back to your bank in France or wherever you live. They check that you have money into your account. I mean, the speed with which all that happens is pretty amazing. I can't quite imagine ourselves. I won't speak about you in this room, but if I go back to my own organization, I think about the cycle time, how slow it is, and how much we have invested. I'm, I'm worried that you know, if the industry is on a path like this, then we might go pretty rapidly up, but the gap might only be getting larger and larger. I think we have to think about how we can come up with public-private partnerships that have a chance of bringing these things together. And of course, harnessing the data tsunami. How do we do that? Well, again, yesterday I was reading the answer of, uh, of companies of the private sector often is machine learning. You know, when I was at, at Google, they were making enormous progress in translation, machine translation, which was pretty much, if you can give me a decent dictionary in two languages and there's at least a million words in it, I can develop a program that can translate uh, reasonably well. And so that is one route. Can we get machine learning to make sense of the data tsunami? But the other one might be to think a bit more about smart data versus big data. That data that actually adds information or that improves a decision. And colleagues in, uh, this is a slide from the Water, Land and Ecosystem, CRP in the, in the CGIR. They believe that rather than, if you like, just accepting the tsunami and trying to swallow from the fire hose, we might do better by actually targeting quite carefully what data we need uh, that would really improve decisions. All right, my last slide. Conclusions, I said, but maybe I should say dream rather. I can't quite say that I base these on facts or on, on data, but I do hope that we will use the power of big and little data to really address not just ever deeper and more specialized issues, as is definitely a temptation, but to address these truly wicked, these truly systems projects, you know, the interlinked issues of health and resilience and sustainability that frankly have escaped us so far. It's still barely possible to measure what resilience of a landscape or what even sustainability of a landscape really means. So those are really big challenges. And frankly, I'm great, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's great that we have the presentation of the yield gap here. Uh, that shows you what the yield gap is. 
I don't think Ken tomorrow when he presents the yield gap atlas is going to suggest that he knows how to close the yield gap because I think closing the yield gap is another massive, truly wicked problem that hopefully through lots of data we could make progress on. And yes, I think we have to find ways to adapt our cycle times. Uh, when I worked at Google, I was not necessarily impressed that the organization I was in reorganized three times in three years because that was painful. But they also had normal project times of, you know, two quarters plus one to give you another chance if you didn't quite make it in two quarters. Now, that might be a bit fast for our world. On the other hand, more rapid cycle times, trying more, trying more and failing more, and accepting that you have to move on. We don't know, we don't sit around, we don't get a lot more data, we just try 10 things, we evaluate, we tick the most promising ones and we move on. I think there's a lot we can learn from that way of doing business that would actually be necessary to harness the power of big data if we want to have a hope of doing that within the time required. If we don't want to do this at a time when we come with a solution and technology is already on the next cycle of the revolution. And finally, I think it is a great opportunity actually to leverage the democratization of knowledge, to have a different relationship with our users, with farmers, and to indeed think of farmers as you know, co-innovators in innovation platforms uh, where we can get their knowledge, we exchange knowledge. We're making steps there, and I think that's still quite a challenge as well. So anyway, those are my hopes, and I have seen many wonderful things on the program. I'm confident that you're going to uh, come up with all kinds of great progress uh, during the next three days. Thank you.